I'm going to be going back to my hometown, Massillon, Ohio. My first major work was a film called Massillon that was shot mostly there. So it's roughly the 20th anniversary of the completion of my first big movie. There's a bridge over the main river that goes through the town, the Tuscarawas River. Uh, in 1894, there was a guy named Coxie who convened a group of unemployed workers there, and it was called Coxie's Army. They started their march at this bridge, and there's a historical plaque commemorating it. They marched on Washington to get better benefits for unemployed workers. I had been employed by the adult video industry in Los Angeles, and I decided to make use of that vast archive in a number of works that I produced between about 2006 and 2007. And I decided that I wanted to expand the purview of what I was doing and not just work with pornography, but use public archives in the United States. The moment you start becoming a little bit successful as an artist in Los Angeles, you have to travel incessantly. One thing I can say is because of the presence of the film industry, um, anything you need is available here. As a filmmaker, I encountered a lot of resistance because I was doing something very much against the grain of what people normally do in this city. But the moment I started calling myself an artist, people were quite willing to help. Killed was really the beginning of a whole new body of work. In the previous work I made, the, the, the experimental documentaries, I think my interest was more in imposing something upon the world. And as I've gotten older, hopefully more mature, I'm interested in what the material has to tell me and in deriving my formal strategies from the material itself. In the case of Killed, this is material that is owned by the people of the United States. Uh, I was unaware of the Killed negatives until fairly recently. And I did a lot of research and some speculation just looking at the material, figuring out why these, these photographs were rejected. What about them caused the director of the program to punch a hole in them? And the hole became the, the focus, the, the object of fascination. The void was the thing that I wanted to concentrate on. So it became the motif for the piece. The killed negatives were almost completely unavailable originally uh, because they had negatives in storage and what was most accessible in the FS FSA collection were the negatives that had been printed. And the killed negatives were never printed. So a few killed negatives were published in books, but there was, there, it was this vast territory that was unknown. When the Library of Congress began its website and started making digitized versions of the negatives available, they started digitizing the killed negatives. And now most of the killed negatives are only available in very low resolution uh, copies. And these were not practical for my purposes. But a limited number of them have been scanned at a high resolution. And those are the ones I used for the piece. Actually, when I made the book, I requested prints. So I think little by little, the number of killed negatives that are available in high resolution scans is, is uh, increasing. I had more available to me when I made the book, which was um, two years after Killed, the, the, the moving image piece was completed. Mm -hmm. I decided to, to organize the book alphabetically by photographer, which meant Walker Evans came first. Uh, as an undergraduate, I studied documentary photography at Yale, and the founder of that program was actually Walker Evans. So there's this profound connection between my formation and this material. I discovered a guy named Theodore Jung, who's not very well known at all, who did a lot of work in Ohio, and many of his negatives were killed. At the beginning of the book, I, I speculate about the historical reasons for the killed negatives. One thing I can say is that uh, Roy Stryker, the director of the program, had a very different attitude about the photographers working for him and their, their project than we would today. He was interested 
as director in having a kind of government photo agency so that publications could publicize the efforts of the New Deal, the Roosevelt administration's projects. So for him, the material was not art, and he had no problem with killing it, punching a hole in the negatives that were considered um, inadequate. Walker Evans found out and was livid. Dorothea Lange was so far away from Washington, D.C. that she processed her material in her own darkroom in Berkeley. And because of this, none of her work was killed. At the time that the FSA was doing its work, conservatives in Congress were interested in defunding it. The striker had an enormous amount of pressure on him. Anything that looked too facetious, anything that looked too artsy, anything that looked too inept was killed so that the adversaries of the FSA in, in Congress couldn't get hold of this material and use it as fodder for their arguments. His attitude changed. There is no paper trail. There is no interview where he elucidated what changed in his attitude, unfortunately. He stopped killing negatives in 1939. David Myers later became quite a famous cinematographer and he shot part of Woodstock. This stuff, you know, it would have been killed if it had been submitted a year before, but because it was submitted in the summer of 1939, uh, Stryker didn't kill it. Uh, the Swirk Pro Progress Administration, it was commissioning works of art from painters and sculptors. A lot of this art was glorifying the common people, uh, the working man, and a lot of it was consciously or unconsciously homoerotic. And I was interested to see if I could find within the FSA archive, which was contemporary with this New Deal, if I could see a kind of glorification of the worker um, that was in line with painting and sculpture at the same time. A lot of what is of interest in the New Deal art is um, a kind of idealization. And since in the FSA you're dealing with photography that's documentary, mm -hmm. Uh, there isn't quite the same thing going on. You know, I think the FSA collection is one of the great monuments of American culture. It's one of the most important things that the U.S. government ever did, and it is a great record of a historical time. But it's a record that is still subject to reinterpretation. What's at stake is writing history.